happens to come in and she looks me in the face and she says to me, you are going to die. Hey guys, I'm Barbie Angel and welcome back to another segment of Let's Chat where we discuss real life issues for the real life woman. So today's video um, is going to be extremely transparent. Um, I'm going to try to stay strong through this video. Um, my heart is beating so fast. <laughs> Up until now, I have not discussed um, with anyone. I have not really expressed how I am feeling, how I am doing. So as you can see by the title, I recently, um, a couple of months ago, I was pregnant with twins. Um, and unfortunately, we did lose our twins um, at 19 weeks pregnant um, in my second trimester. As you guys know, if you have been following my journey, I have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, I also have an incompetent cervix, and I have also had a prior loss at 19 weeks pregnant, um, which was my first pregnancy. So this time around, we knew that to have a sustaining pregnancy, we would have to, you know, take precautionary measures. So the first step that we took kind of on this journey to getting pregnant was going to a fertility specialist. Um, our fertility speci specialist was amazing. In April of 2019 is when we started our journey. So in April, we went for our first consultation. So her first thing that she wanted to do was kind of evaluate me, do an ultrasound to make sure everything was okay. She didn't know that my fallopian tube was blocked. So the next step in the process was to get an MRI. Um, and I'm gonna mention that during this time, I was also suffering from like major headaches and um, dizzy spells and like like I would be losing my balance sometimes. I would get like really shaky or just get like really sweaty. So during the time of dealing with the fertility specialist, I also was starting to see a neurologist as well. So um, the neurologist and my fertility specialist, they have me go for this MRI. Um, I go for the MRI. They see that there is a, definitely a large mass in my um, blocking my left uh, fallopian tube and then I had an MRI of my brain done as well and they saw that I had a pituitary tumor on my like on the on the base of my brain um so yeah they, they saw that I had the mass and then the tumor and during the process of trying to get pregnant um I had to have surgery to get the mass removed from my from my fallopian tube so I had a lot going on during this time um I had the surgery done in August of 2019 surgery actually went really well they feel like on the way to you know starting our fertility treatments um so then I would go to my neurologist and I would have to go and see a bunch of specialists for that. Initially we wanted to do um, IVF. My doctor decided that IVF was probably not the best option for us just because of my history and my cervix opening up early. I believe that you know IVF would be a higher chance of having multiples and she was very adamant that we had to ensure that I had one preg that I was pregnant with one baby and that would be my best bet. So we didn't do the IVF we um, actually did IUI, and I'll put like things on the screen just in case you guys don't know what these like acronyms mean or whatever. So we went with the IUI, so with that I started taking Letrozole, which is a medication that you take to kind of like help help you ovulate. So during the course of the Letrozole, the Letrozole treatment, um, that third time that we went in, they did mention that my eggs were, you know, too small again, um, and that they didn't think that it would take and then there was the the concern about the multiples as well because i had so many eggs so they didn't want to do the iui they wanted us to um just try again the next month so we didn't have the insemination for the iui um we get pregnant and so i find out literally the exact day or like the exact week that i found out with found out about my daughter that i was pregnant i found out in november um and that was kind of like the same time that i found out i was pregnant with my daughter it was kind of like the same kind of information that was given to us with my daughter that oh the eggs were too small we weren't you know it would be hard for it to for some reason, um, I knew. I just feel like everything was happening the same way it happened with my daughter. And in my heart, I knew that I was going to get pregnant. And when they say manifestation and all these things, I feel like I manifested my twins. And during this whole time, we were looking for a house as well. So that was, you know, just to kind of paint a picture of everything that was going on in my life at that time. It was, I think, maybe either that Friday or the Friday before that my realtor called us and was like, oh, we we got our house. We um, can, we had to sign all the the paperwork everything was good and in that moment in that instant I literally said I'm pregnant like I knew like everything that we had been wanting for all of this time everything that we had been striving for that we have been praying for I just knew in my heart 
that this was the moment that everything was going to come to fruition. And I said it, I said, I'm pregnant, but it was probably like a week later. Um, and I tested at like 5 a.m. in the morning um, and <laughs> I was pregnant. And I remember feeling like, oh my gosh. Like, I remember I just went into the room and I just kind of like tapped my husband and woke him up and I just like showed him the test. I was just so incredibly happy, but I was so incredibly scared. We decided we wouldn't tell anyone, but I think I told my sister like the next day or something <laughs> because I just couldn't keep it and I had to tell somebody. Um, and we had to obviously confirm it with the doctor and we went to the, our doctor's appointment. I got blood work drawn. They confirmed that I was pregnant. When I first found out I didn't, I wasn't really emotional. I just was like in shock. I didn't really believe it. Um, and then when they called me, I was at work. I remember I started bawling like, oh my God, I'm really pregnant. Like, this is really happening. All of these amazing emotions that were coming to me at once. At about five weeks pregnant, I was at work and I started, I started bleeding um, and I immediately was like in panic mode. I left and I get in the car, I call the doctors, they tell me to come in, I go straight to the doctors. I was five weeks and three days at that point um, and they checked me, they couldn't find anything that indicated that I was pregnant. Um, so they believed I was having an ectopic pregnancy and I'll just put that on the screen what that is if you guys don't know what that is. Um, which is very dangerous and very um, it could be life-threatening so so they wanted me to come back the next day which would be a Friday to kind of do the testing again because they, they figured either I am having an ectopic pregnancy or it was just too soon for them to be able to see anything and again for testing they still don't see anything they believe that I am indeed having an ectopic pregnancy they um, then say that I will have to come in the next day which is Saturday for surgery go to our next appointment on that Saturday for them to kind of check everything before they you know schedule procedure and surgery and all of that to remove the ectopic pregnancy that they thought it was um and I'm laying there and I remember I'm looking up the ceiling and I am praying to God please do not let this be something that is going wrong um and honestly when we were driving up there in my mind I was like maybe I was having twins and one of the twins is you know being miscarried and the other one is going to be okay like this is this is my thought process going into this appointment like everything is going to be okay there's no way that this that this baby isn't going to make it so we go in um I'm laying down on the table and the technician she's looking she's doing all these things okay yeah she's like okay there it is and she's measuring it and she's like oh wait there's another one and in my mind i'm like wait what Did she just say it's another one and she's pr they're printing out the pictures and everything and she's giving the measurements and i am like there's two there has to be two everything's fine there's nothing nothing is wrong the doctor comes in and she's like oh um did she tell you what was going on? And I was like, no, she didn't say anything. And she was like, well, you guys are having twins. I felt like somebody punched me in the gut. Like I was out of breath. I couldn't, I was like holding my chest. I couldn't breathe. I just was like in shock. Like, what are you talking about? Like I literally manifested this whole thing and it's happening. Like I was in complete and utter shock. My husband, my husband's like really laid back and chill. Um, like even with the whole bleeding and everything he wasn't like in a panic like I was he literally is like everything's gonna be fine Like that's his mindset like so he I'm looking at him and he's like not really giving off any kind of emotion My doctor obviously was very very concerned about me being pregnant with twins because she was very adamant that that was not the best thing for me um but like I said, she was amazing. Straight up, she was like, you can't stay at this hospital because they will not do anything for you. Um, being as though you have this history and you are now pregnant with twins, they will not do anything to intervene to kind of help you make sure that you maintain these twins. She contacted another hospital um, that she knew were like the top for, you know, multiples and all of and with my health issues and concerns that have handled those things and have delivered successful pregnancies. And she called them, like she called the, the vice president, like she called the vice president and she was like, this is my, this is the case that I have. I'm going to transfer her over. Can you guys help her? And, this, and the vice president's like, you know what? Send her our way. We're going to do everything we can. Whenever, if she goes to an appointment and they said they can't do anything, tell her to drop my name. And they will make sure that she is top priority, that she is um, always treated with the utmost respect and that everything is going to work out. When I tell you, when that lady called me and told me this, I was in tears, like... In my mind, I'm like, yo, God is working overtime right now. Like, everything has to be perfect. Like, this is going, like, how is it that this lady is going above and beyond to ensure that I have a healthy pregnancy to make sure that nothing happens to my babies? I had to leave the other hospital because they do not do cerclages with people that have twins um, just because of research and whatever the case may be that it shows that it's not effective or whatever it is. So we go under the impression that I would immediately get the cerclage at 13 weeks. 
um, but that was not the case. So with twin pregnancies, I have checked every hospital. Nobody does a cerclage with twins. This is the only hospital that will do it, um, but they do it on a kind of research basis or like a trial basis. Then, um, then they would like put you in this program or research program where it was like a lottery, like they would pick your name and if you were picked, then you would get your cerclage. So at this point, I'm about maybe 12 weeks pregnant and I'm like, no, y'all, I'm not being put in no program to maybe I'll get a surclage. Like, I need a surclage. I'm not waiting until 15 weeks because, as my history shows, at 19 weeks, I'm three centimeters dilated. So, with twins, my mindset is like, um, obviously, let's be smart here. If I'm having two, it's going to open up a lot earlier. So, if we're waiting until 15 weeks to check me, that might be too late. And I dropped the name of the VP and director of the program. And I dropped his name. And I'm like, he said this, that, and the third. And they're like, all right, we're going to work out. We're going to we're gonna figure it out. They go. They move it around. They're like, all right, starting today, we're going to check you every week and make sure that everything's okay. Um, and then, you know, if you start to open up, then we will do this to clash. I'm put at the head of the schedule. Um, they are checking me so that at that point, I was fine. Nothing was wrong. Everything was going good. Then at 15 weeks, I come in and I am three centimeters dilated. Throughout my pregnancy at this point, I was going through a lot of like different painful movements and whatever the case may be. And when I did would have my doctor's appointments, they're like, oh, it's because you're having two. Um, it's, it's normal. It was just, it was painful. Like this pregnancy was extremely painful. I was like, I feel like I couldn't move sometimes. Like I would have like so much back pain. I would have so much pain in my hips and my lower abdomen. Like it was always painful. So at this point in time, we go in, like I said, for the 15 weeks and my cervix is completely open. Um, she said it's open this um, three centimeters. Uh, really get the full amount because it was so painful to check. Um, it hurts so bad. So they rush me to the hospital um, and they give us the options, of course. You can terminate or you can do the surclass. The surclass. Not 100% because of how open you are and all of these, all of this other stuff. And I'm like, you know what, we're going to do, do the surclass. We knew we were going to do the surclass. Um, I stay overnight. Next day we go in for the procedure. I have my, um, I go into the operating room. So they do the procedure and after that he comes up and he tells me, he's like, we did the best that we could. Um, you were open the size of a golf ball and, um, but everything, you know, we were able to stitch everything up. Nothing is open. It's nice and secure. So it's pretty much a wait and see at this point. The due date was July 23rd, but they were not letting me go past, um, June 30th. So as you guys are seeing this video, today is now my due date and is why I want to post this video. So June 30th is when I would deliver if I was to make it full term. Um, at this point, I am working from home indefinitely, um, but there was no other like real symptoms of anything being wrong. Um, at this point, we still haven't really told anyone. So for us, once we passed that 19 week mark is when we were going to start telling people um, we had planned to do, you know, um, a big like housewarming party and then in the housewarming party we were going to do a surprise like gender reveal. So everything was literally getting planned at this moment. Um, but for me, I wanted to wait till we got past 19 weeks because for me, 19 weeks was when things always go wrong. So I wanted to make sure we got past 19 weeks. At this point in time, you know, we're starting to begin the planning phase because like, everything's going good. Like to, to me, to us, to the doctors, we're good. Like there's nothing to be concerned about. So we're planning our, our things and I'm so excited and I can't wait to be able to tell everybody what's going on and to share this amazing news with everybody. So we get to 18 weeks um, and at 18 weeks I am so terrified, so scared. Um, it's like I just wanted to get past 19 weeks so badly um, and I just feel like as much as I manifested everything that was happening, um, maybe me being so scared and thinking that of all the things that could go wrong had something to do with what happened I don't know but the day before I turn 19 weeks I start um, I'm like in like a lot of pain so I'm in this pain and you know I didn't really think too much of it because you know as I said I've, I have been in a lot of pain already Tuesday we hit 19 weeks I am in like off and on pain um, Wednesday comes I'm okay Wednesday night I feel like a lot of pain um, I think it was about maybe 11 11 o'clock at night I could not move like I had to lay in the couch um, and it was just so much pain and I'm like yo am I having contractions like what is this pain um, and I'm like we're gonna have to go to the hospital tomorrow um, because this is crazy so we didn't go to the hospital right at that moment um, my husband's like all right come come go to bed you know tomorrow we'll go to the 
doctors we can call them in the morning and be seen so i go to bed around like four or five o'clock in the morning um i wake up i get up and i'm like all right let me just go to the bathroom i get up to go to the bathroom and there is like I feel, there's like a leak dripping down my leg and i'm like did my water just break and when i go to the bathroom like things fine um i come back i wake up my husband i was like i we need to go to the hospital i think my water just broke um, we go to the to the ER, they take us to labor and delivery, they check me, they're like, oh, um, your water didn't break, they do like a little swab test or whatever that that can confirm if your water broke or not. They're like, your water didn't break, um, but we do see like a slight infection, they don't know where the infection came from, um, but they're like, okay, we'll give you like antibiotics and we'll keep you here for a couple of hours, we'll send you home with some more antibiotics and then, um, you know, you should be fine. So the, the, they gave me the antibiotics. The, um, I was having like slight contractions, they were monitoring that, but once I got the antibi antibiotics in, about two hours later, the contractions and everything had stopped, so they said the pain was from this infection that was kind of like brewing, um, don't, like I said, they don't know where the infection came from, um, so yeah, they give us the, give me the medication, they uh, get the prescription for overnight, whatever, and they send us home, um, I go home, I'm like sleep pretty much the whole day. Um, I take my medication and then that night, maybe about midnight, I sit up. When I sit up, I feel a gush and I'm like, that was my water. My water has definitely broken now. Um, so I go to the bathroom. I'm bleeding at this point. I call the, the, the hospital um, and they're like, you definitely need to come in. We'll check you and all of that. And um, as we're driving, I could feel the gush just keep coming and keep coming. And I knew for a fact that my water had broken at that point. Um, it just kept coming out and kept coming out. And I'm just like praying. Um, like I said, I've done my research. So I know that there's a chance that your water can break and that you could still make it, you know, months with your water being broken. You just have to be, you know, really precautious and all of that. So I knew there's a chance that everything could still be okay. We get to the hospital. They check me. Um, indeed, my water had broken, but it was only broken on baby A. Um, so baby's B water was intact. They were fine. Um, but baby's A water was broken. Um, the heartbeats were still strong. They were still moving and, and kicking and all of that. So at that point, they're like, okay, the first thing we need to do is take out your cerclage because there's a higher risk of you getting another infection things things could progress with you having the cerclage and, and it's very dangerous to you um but i was very like i was scared to take out my cerclage because i'm like okay the babies are obviously bigger now if i take out the cerclage am i not going to just go straight into labor like i know that there's a chance my water can be broken and i could still you know hold on to these babies so i didn't want to take out my cerclage and i wanted to wait for my doctor to come and they're calling my doctor um and she you know she's on her way but she isn't there yet you know she can speak with you she's she's telling us the same thing this is your your best bet you have to take the cerclage out eventually i decide all right my doctor's here at this point and she's telling me you know that was my you know that i made the right decision to take the the, to take the cerclage out when I did um, and then she kind of goes into like okay now what is our next step so she confirms what I said that you know my water can be broken and I could still go to full term like that doesn't just because my water has broken doesn't mean that the you know it's the end of the road she's like um, so what we will do at this point is they will move me from this labor and delivery room and they'll set up you know like my own room that I was staying in the hospital now um, you know, they would transfer me over to that room and that kind of be where, that's kind of where I would stay at this point. And she's telling us, you know, I would just be, you know, be on bed rest and having any more contractions and everything was still stable and, you know, nothing was progressing. It was just a wait and see at that point. So we decided to do that. We're going to wait and see. We're going to, I'm going to stay in the hospital. Um, at this point, um, I don't think I mentioned, but my mom and my sister had got to the hospital as well. So at this point, once we hear like, okay, there's still hope, they leave. Um, and then we're in the process of kind of transferring transferring me from labor and delivery to like my own like now my room that I'm going to stay in and they're like okay the my nurse comes in she's like oh you know your doctor just wants us to run some blood tests and blood work and put all your blood work in and things like that and then um they're in the process of getting you your room so you'll be moving over you're, you're about to move to your room shortly so they do they run all the blood work and all of that and then she they come in my doctor comes in and another two other doctors come in and they're like you had the infection has now traveled to your bloodstream um and now we're in critical condition now we're in um like the scary stage and they're like um the infection has tra traveled to your blood your temperatures are still fine but once you get to like a, your temperature reaches like 110 i think it was um is when we know that we are like really really in critical condition and you could possibly lose your life um so right now we can confirm that the your blood work shows that the infection is in your bloodstream it can travel to your heart it can travel to your brain 
um and at that point there's nothing we can do you're going to lose your life so at this point they're telling me my only option now is to induce labor and have my babies and my babies are not going to make it because they're only 19 weeks i lose it i am screaming i am crying i'm like i can't do this again please do not make me do this how like god why are you doing this to me I'm screaming and the doctors are like, all right, we're gonna give you some time to kind of process everything. But they're basically telling, you know, me everything that can happen. At this point, my temperature hasn't risen yet. So we're still, you know, we're in critical condition because the, the infection is in my bloodstream, but my temperatures were still stable and all of that. So they were coming in about every 15 minutes at this point, trying to like check me and stuff. I'm crying, my husband is by my side and he's emotional as well. And he's telling me like, you know, we have our daughter, we have Aaliyah, so we need you. We can't let this happen and you not make it. So we have to induce labor. And I'm just like ignoring him, honestly. I just, in my mind, I'm just like, God do something. Like God do something, like please do something, intervene and you know, he, ca he calls my mom and my sister and they're on their way back and um, I couldn't believe what was going on and I was just praying like there has to be something like God, where are you? Like, what are you doing? There has to be something. This can't be it. So the doctor, the nurse comes back in, she checks my temperature. I think my temperature was like 106 at that point um, and it just kept rising. My temperature just kept rising. Um, and at that point, I was starting to feel different. Like, I was starting to feel like lightheaded. I was starting to feel very weak. And in my mind, I felt myself slipping away. Um, I didn't tell my husband. I don't, I don't think up until this point, I haven't told anyone this. But I felt myself starting to slip away. And I think the only thing that made me give up, I would say, and decide to induce labor was because of my daughter. She is the only thing. She's the only thing that keeps me going and I'm like, she needs me. And I decided to induce labor. Um, my doctor just happens to come in. She sits down next to me. She looks me in the face and she says to me, you are going to die. If you do not induce labor right now, you are not going to make it. Um, she said there are two options. We can give you a pill and you will, um, you'll, we'll give you a pill and it'll induce your labor that way and you can deliver naturally. You'll be able to hold your babies. You'll be able to look at them and, or we can take you straight into surgery. Um, we'll put you to sleep, but you won't be able to see them. And I knew I had to see my babies. I knew I had to see them. I, but you know, obviously there was a risk with that because inducing labor, um, is not a quick thing. It's all dependent on your body, um, so, but I chose to induce, la to induce labor naturally with the pill and deliver and hold my babies and my husband didn't want me to do it, my mom didn't want me to do it, um, but I had to see my, I had to see my, my children. Um, so, they give me the pill, my temperature now is at the 110 or whatever, and I, I literally feel loopy, I feel so like I feel like I'm not gonna make it. And I hear my I hear my doctor saying to my mom um, that I'm probably gonna have to go into the ICU. There's a very good chance that I still won't make it. And I hear them all crying and all of these things and we induce the labor. Um, at this point, my, my stepdad is there, my dad is there, my stepmom is there. They're all with me in the room um, as I'm like going through the contractions and everything. Um, and it's time to it's time just to push out my babies. And I think right at the time where um, I started to push, my cousin comes in, my maid of honor that I told you guys about. She comes in um, and she's holding. She comes in right at the right moment. I don't even know how how they let her in or whatever. She comes in. She's holding my hand and I'm um, delivering my babies and I deliver my baby boy first. He was baby A. I deliver my baby boy. I look at him and he is beautiful. Oh my God. And when they tell me it's a boy, I am. I start crying hysterically because I just want to give my husband a baby boy. I want a son. My daughter has wanted a little brother for the longest. And this is the second time we're losing our son. And I'm just like, what? And I'm crying and I'm screaming. 
and I'm holding him and I'm looking at him and he's so perfect everything is formed like it was just I'm holding him in my hands and then I deliver my baby girl and she looks exactly like my daughter she's moving in my arms and I'm and I can't even and I and I just remember screaming and crying and I remember when they wanted to take them away from me I just couldn't let go like I just needed to hold them I just wanted them with me and I'm apologizing to them and telling them that I am so sorry because obviously this is my fault that this has happened and um remember just feeling so defeated um and then it comes to the point where my placenta is stuck both of my placentas are stuck um my twins were both in individual sacks they both had their, their own um placentas but they are both stuck and they can't get them out and i am starting to hemorrhage um i am bleeding so much and they're like we have to rush you into surgery um because we can't get your placenta out and we're now in do or die we get to the operating room they rush me over i'm in the operating room um and they put like the mask on me for like oxygen and i'm like oh and i'm claustrophobic so i start freaking out i'm like oh can we please not put this on me yet they're like okay we'll, we'll move it they just have it like hanging on my chin and they're like um we won't put it on until we're ready to to, to, to go start the procedure and i hear the doctors or the nurses and the anesthesiologist talking and there's something wrong with the computer or there's something wrong with something and they're like oh this isn't right something's wrong what do we do and i'm freaking out like they're they don't know what's going on with whatever i don't know what exactly was the issue but i think it was the computer or something was wrong and my doctor starts screaming like we don't have time for this f this f the the screen or whatever the hell, hell was wrong she's like f it we have to do this right now or she's not going to make it um the machine started to beep and i don't know if it was my oxygen or what it was but something like something was going on and my doctor is literally screaming at everybody like we have to start this now like we like we have to go right now there's there's no more time to waste um and they come back to put the mask on me and i'm freaking out and, and they had my arms like tied down so i can't move my arms but i'm moving my head i'm screaming i'm like no i'm going to and in my heart i felt like i was going to die like i felt like that was the end um i felt like i was going to die i started screaming i'm freaking out i'm like please no i have a daughter i i don't want to die and my doctor comes over and she's looking at me and she says you have to calm down i am not going to let anything happen to you but we have to operate right now you are losing so much blood and they literally forced the mask on me and they're holding me down and obviously before i know it i'm out um when i wake back up i am in back in the room that i delivered in um i think at that point it was probably only my husband there i think my family had left my cousin had left it was just the hardest thing to have to go through again i still am not okay like i said this is the first time that i am even telling my story this is the first time i'm even like expressing anything about this whole event i couldn't talk to my sister or my mom like i would talk to my sister like me and my sister would talk like every single day for like hours at a time it took me weeks to be able to, to call her to be able to talk to her on the phone like she would call me and text me and i would just ignore it just be i couldn't talk to her i couldn't talk to my mom i couldn't talk to my husband i couldn't look my husband in the face for about three weeks i feel like i couldn't look him in the eye my one cousin that i mentioned i couldn't speak to her like she would call me and text me i would i was ignoring everybody's phone calls but especially them these people that i talk to all the time every day i couldn't talk to them i felt like i let everybody down especially my husband Everybody was so excited for this. Everybody was so excited for this and they were so happy and they were praying and because of me, nothing happened the way it was supposed to. It is all my fault. Um, to this day, I still can't talk to my husband about it because I feel like he did. I'm just, I just feel so bad that I keep taking this away from him. Having to tell our daughter that we lost the babies was so hard for me oh my gosh like i don't even think she really understood because we told her and you know she cried and then like later on in the night she came over to me and she said something about like oh um i think she asked me something about that. i said yeah it's a girl and a boy and she said um oh so when can they like come now and i was like they're not coming anymore like they're gone they're in heaven 
and she started crying again and I don't think it didn't hit her until that moment that she wasn't gonna have her brother and her sister um and she just was like all I want is a little brother and why is it not happening and she was crying and I was just so emotional and I just felt like I let everybody down um I think I have YouTube has saved me honestly um i have kind of immersed myself into my youtube i have immersed myself into like some other things that i'm working on just to kind of not focus on my main pain or what i'm going through or what i'm feeling um i don't think i'm going to ever be okay my husband actually asked me the other day he was like are you happy and i told him i don't think i'll ever be happy again because i was so happy for the first time in my life I felt genuinely 100% happy. We were married. We had bought our dream home. I was pregnant with twins. Um, my daughter, straight A student, she's doing amazing. I had my career. Everything that I had dreamed of was happening. Um, like I was genuinely 100% happy and out of nowhere that was all taken from me. And I don't feel like I can ever let myself feel that happy again. Of course, I love my baby girl. She is my life. She is my world. I love my husband to death. He is my rock. Um, my mother, my sister, my parents, like everybody's amazing. Um, I have amazing friends. Um, I feel like, but I'm never going to have the joy. I'm never going to have the experience of having my two babies. Um, I wanted five kids and then being diagnosed with PCOS, I knew that that was probably nearly impossible. Um, so for us, even having the one was a miracle. So thinking that maybe we could have two, that was even more of like a blessing. But to find out that we were having twins and this could have been our last pregnancy and we could have had our three children and been done, I will never get to have that again. Um, pregnancy for me is extremely hard, extremely difficult. You know, it's extremely scary. I'm always going to be extremely grateful for my daughter. There's nothing that can ever take take away from that. I love her endlessly. Like that is my whole entire world. I breathe for her. Um, but she wants a sibling so badly. And I feel so horrible that it's not that easy to just give her that. It's not that easy to, to I want a baby boy. I want I just want my babies back. Um, I just want my babies back and I know that I will never have them again. I know that they're gone and it just breaks my heart. Like why? Like God why? And I'm so mad and I'm so angry at God and I try to be positive and I have my life, I have my family, I have all of this and my husband, you know, he'll reassure me and remind me that we have all of these good things. And I don't want to sound ungrateful and say it's not enough, but that's how I feel. Like, it's not enough because I had everything. Like, can you imagine everything that you would ever dream for in your life? Like, I don't, I don't need to have bags and shoes and all of these crazy things. Like, of course, my house is, I have a, my dream house. But for me, being um, financially secure, having my family and all, like, those were my dreams. Like, I always wanted to have, and I always wanted to have twins. And all, like, I had everything that I had ever wanted in the palm of my hands. Like, it was, I had it. I could feel it. I could see it. I had, the life that I had, had envisioned for myself, I had it. And it was literally ripped away from me. How do you get past that? Like, how do you, how do you get past that? Like, I don't know how to be okay. I just don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I have literally, like, YouTube, I can't even thank you guys enough for those that support me, watch me, subscribe to me. Like, I can't thank you guys enough because this has been my saving grace. Um, and just even, like, as soon as June hit, like, I started feeling like blah and it's been hard to kind of put stuff out and all of that because I knew like June was when I was supposed to bring my babies home so even like the last two weeks I have been so out of it that I kind of like started a new thing that I just to kind of put my time and energy and my thought process into something just to, to not have to deal with what I'm feeling and dealing and thinking and my emotions and I know like quarantine and, and extremely hard for everyone but honestly for me it came at the perfect time like I said this all happened in February I delivered my babies on February 29th and a week later quarantine happened and it was literally a blessing in disguise for me because I was not ready to see anybody. I was not ready to go anywhere. I still am not ready to go anywhere. Um, I thank God that my job um, has been very flexible with this whole quarantine. We're not scheduled to even go back to work until after Labor Day, which is September. There's a good chance I won't even be back until closer to January. And I'm so grateful for that because honestly, I probably would have quit my job 
Um, I am not mentally prepared. I am not emotionally prepared. I am not ready to be back to regular life. Um, I'm just not, I'm not there yet. And I don't know what it's going to take for me to get there. I don't know what time has to pass. Um, I might jump on the camera and I'm smiling and I'm bubbly. This is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm doing. Um, and another thing I didn't mention was that through this whole, you know, process, there was tumors that were found on my cervix that they thought I had cancer and I had to get like biopsies and all of these things done, you know, and it's just, I've been dealing with a lot. Um, and then I still, you know, once outside opens, I have to go back to dealing with my MRI for my brain and all of that to kind of make sure that that tumor isn't growing or that it's not causing anything or all of these things that I still have to deal with. And I'm just not ready. I'm not ready to be back to regular stuff, going out and things like that. Like I have been concerned and very strict with seeing people or being around anybody that's been out and doing all this stuff um, especially because of me have gotten having this infection and I don't I haven't really had a checkup since all of this has happened to make sure that my immune system is good and all of that we don't know where the infection came from we just know that I developed a maternal sepsis um, and I don't know what something like the virus would do for me um, so I haven't been anywhere um, my cousin had a drive-by um, we had a drive-by graduation party for her that was like the first time that I was even out anywhere and then you guys saw that I had the, the um, event for my husband, which was only like a handful of people. If you guys notice, I wear this necklace probably in all of my videos. This was something that they gave me um, at the hospital. Um, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it has two um, like little baby footprints and they gave me these two, um, they're like gold wedding band looking things. So I just ordered this necklace and it has a heart on it um, and it has a little angel wing and it has my baby's birthstone on it, which is like purple. Um, I also got this ring here in the middle of my wedding band and my engagement ring that is their birthstone as well. Um, I'm just trying to like find a way to kind of push through. Um, their room is still untouched. I don't even like my daughter going in there. I still have not been able to have like a full conversation with my husband about everything. I just feel like I'm not mentally there yet. Um, so him seeing this with all of you will be the first time he even sees how I'm feeling um, as far as in the same for my sister and my mom. But um, I know this video is probably extremely long at this point. I needed to share what I have been dealing with, what I have been going through and it's real. It's real life. Like I didn't want to come on here and be so fluffy. I just wanted to be really real and and share some of the things that we go through in life um as always i thank you guys so 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 much for watching i appreciate you guys you don't even understand thing honestly to have support from so many people um and yeah i will see you guys in the next one i thank you guys so 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 much for watching bye